Okay, I guess we'll get started. Um, wonderful to see familiar faces and maybe a few new faces as well. Uh, for those who don't know who I am, I, I, I'm still trying to figure out who I am, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Me too. Yeah, really. Well, eventually, we're get still evolving. Evolving. It's more like devolve. Devolve. George Wright, I've taught at Cal State Chico for uh, 36 years. I taught political science uh, there, including international politics oriented courses. And uh, uh, I had a good time when I was there. And, uh, um, and uh, there's so many, I, there are all kinds of things running through my head right now. I think I remember most wonderfully about Chico uh, were the personalities and characters uh, of the old days. And I think they start off with Carl Hine and Old Hutch and, mm -hmm. and uh, people like that. And then it runs through Larry Wenzel and, <laughs> and Homer Metcalf, you know, oh, yeah. Bill Rector, all, all of our mentors. Yeah. So the place has been a very, very rich place for eccentric, uh, interesting, but radical personalities and people. Yeah. And our goal is to continue that in Chico right now, okay. Um, I've been working my, my tail off to prepare a lecture and it's right here. Um, and uh, I, I apologize if it's a little too academic or formal at the start but hopefully we can open it up for some discussion and questions and get your opinions about some of these issues. Um, the last time we met, uh, we talked about the events around Gaza, and uh, I don't necessarily want to repeat any of that information, but some of it may come up in our presentation and certainly in the question and answer period. What I really want to talk about is exactly what the assigned topic of the discussion is about, and that's to look at the United States' policies uh, related to the so-called two-front wars that are fighting at the moment where it's involved in. Hey, Will, calm down. Will. Calm down, Will. Come on, come on. This is an important subject. Come on, come on. And the two-front wars, obviously, the uh, support with uh, the complicity with uh, Israel over its genocide in Gaza and for that matter the West Bank as well. And the other war is the Ukrainian war uh, which is a proxy war on the part of the United States and uh, my view on that and I think it's pretty well known is that I look at the, the U.S. is actually using Ukraine as a sacrificial lamb uh, to actually confront Russia with specific objectives of, of creating, a, a trying to break its economy and to create a regime change there. Uh, and uh, from the American point of view, hopefully to have a, a Yeltsin type character come into power. Uh, and how close has the U.S. come to achieving its objectives? And what is the impact of these wars on U.S. hegemony, uh, U.S. global hegemony at this point in time. And uh, what I also want to do, and we'll hand these out to you when I finish these comments, but I'd like to walk through a chart that I worked on uh, that kind of lays out U.S. foreign policy from the beginnings, from 1945. And I think this chart will give you a really a, a good framework to understand uh, the U U.S. Uh, imperial state, as James Petrus used to call it, and where, why we are, where we are at the present time. Um, as I said last time I met with you guys, um, I'm always concerned about the big picture, and then the goal is to kind of narrow it down to the specific problems or case studies at hand. And to kind of repeat what I said last time, the, uh, how I start with the big picture is uh, to look at um, the nature of the uh, hierarchical uh, uh, interstate, excuse me, the integrated hierarchical 
interstate world capitalist system, okay? Let me say that again. The uh, integrated hierarchical interstate world capitalist system, and, and which is kind of like a, a, there's a center, there's a periphery, and then there's a semi-periphery around the center. And specific states are in particular locations. In the center of the core of that system, are the imperialist countries, uh, the United States, and the East, and, the, and Europe, and to some, and Japan would fit into that as well. On, on the periphery are countries that have a manufacturing base, uh, but are not uh, are not on the level, either technologically, fi financially, or militarily, that the core countries are. And on the periphery. On the semi, excuse me. On the yeah, that's a semi periphery. On the periphery are countries that basically just have raw materials to provide to the core, and there's also a fourth level as well, and that's the the so-called failed states. Those are the countries that have no resources at all and uh, are basically basket cages, cases economically and socially. Um, what we're going to propose is the U.S. military sometimes creates these states as well in its pursuit of profit. When you look at that system, what we see is that capital tend and resources tend to gravitate towards the core to make the core wealthy or wealthier. Um, the point I want to really focus on, though, is when you look at this system from uh, 1492 when it started, when we see the first world system, a uh, global world system, we see certain patterns or contours in that system. And uh, the patterns tend to be a hegemonic power in power. And it is hegemonic because it has the most powerful military. It has the most dominant economic plant and it also has uh, the, uh, the most, uh, uh, it has the dominant currency, if you will, and also it has the moral high ground, meaning it defines itself as the indispensable nation, if you will, to use a current term. And this, the, the, once you have this hegemon, once a hegemon exists, it has the ability to exploit um, other regions, other countries, or other territories throughout the world. And that, in fact, creates even more wealth for the core country or for this hegemon. But what also happens is at a particular point in time, uh, that core country is challenged by a emerging state uh, that has new technologies, uh, more effective uh, industrial or economic plant, it develops an effective and maybe even a competitive military. And what we see are challenges that the competitor state has to the hegemon. And what happens is what I'd like to refer to as a fault line. And along that fault line is uh, competition between the hegemon and the competitor state. There's rivalry between the two forces. And then there are wars between the two forces. And the patterns tend to be Portugal, Spain, uh, eventually, Britain and France fought for quite a long time. And then we see in 1815, we see Britain become the dominant hegemon. Uh, it's Pax Britannica lasts throughout most of the 19th century. And then the second, the last quarter of the 19th century, we see the rise of competitor states once again. Uh, the United States, Germany, Japan, uh, et cetera. And then we entered a 65 year period of warfare. And by 1945, uh, that period ends and the United States comes out of uh, that period as the next hegemon, okay? And uh, it carries out policies to further that interest. What we're kind of, cons what we want to propose is that in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the, there was no longer a bipolar world order, 
and the United States found itself in a position where it could pursue absolute global hegemony. hegemony. And uh, it had access now to areas of the world, resources of the world that it had not had prior to 1991. Uh, what we see then is instead of a bipolar world, we have a unipolar world order. And the United States pursues this uh, objective from 91 up until somewhere between 2001 to 2014, maybe 2017, the, 2017, the world tends to change. And what we begin to see somewhere between 2001 and 2017, the rise of competitor states, once again, to US interests, okay? And those competitor states are China, as well as uh, Russia, and perhaps Iran might fit into that as well. And so what I wanna propose is that we're living in a period where there is a shift from a unipolar world order, which means a relative decline of US hegemony into a period of multipolar, a, a multipolar order. Now we haven't, at one level, uh, we've reached that stage, but there is the stage is not stabilized because there's still along this fault line between the United States as a hegemon and uh, these competitor states, there are competition, rivalry, and warfare. And what I kind of want to propose is that the uh, Ukraine war, as well as the uh, war in Israel, fits on this uh, fault line. And depending on the results of these wars will determine uh, whether the relative decline of the United States will accelerate or whether the U.S. achieves its objective as being the, uh, the uh, achieve the objective of being an absolute global hegemon. Um, I'm trying to improvise all of this kind of stuff off the top of my head. Um, there's, that's, so that's the first point we want to make. The second point is understanding uh, this situation today, we need to look at historical context. Uh, we, we can't understand political events that happen without situating them within the a, a historical context. The, the events of uh, October 7th, for example, for example, when Hamas attacked Israel as it's been described, has been presented to us by the corporate media and by the US government, and for that matter, the Israeli government, and many of its collaborators in, in Europe, is that that event was unprovoked. Well, we understand that you can't, it, it wasn't unprovoked. There was a context to this, uh, to this episode. And so, uh, uh, I think it's very, very, very important to uh, recognize, to use the to implement uh, this idea of historic con historical context to understand political events. Uh, for some reason, I'm, I'm a little nervous today. You guys are just looking at me. And, uh, it's kind of I'm longing to hear okay, it's, more it's, information. It's, it's, it's kind of it's a funny <laughs> feeling. I'm sitting at home in front of my computer, and then there's all these human faces here, you know. Um, maybe what we can do, to, to change this, maybe we can get, George, you can get a little relaxed here. I very seldom get nervous, by the way, in front of a group, so. Uh, it, you were a little nervous yesterday. Huh? Chilling your pot, you were a little nervous then. Well, I, I, I don't know. I've been drinking too much wine, maybe. <laughs> okay, I think I'm, I'm a little calmer now. Okay, now, when we a, a couple points here. Let's get back. Let me use my notes rather than talk off the top of my head. Maybe that's what we need to do. Um, related to this historic context, uh, the, 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 there is a political event, and it has to be examined within a political context. 
And that political context consists of a history, a history of social, economic, political, and, in, and even technological processes that occur over a period of time. Those social, economic, political, and technological processes also are combined with uh, human agency. Uh, when meaning that uh, President Putin on February 24th made the decision to intervene in, Yugos in, uh, in U Ukraine. Hamas obviously made the decision to attack um, uh, Israel on, what was it, October 7th. But that agency was within a context of these social processes. So when we look at uh, the Ukraine story or we look at Gaza, we have to incorporate those processes. Related to Ukraine, uh, I think the most common examples are the U.S. decision to pursue uh, NATO enlargement through Eastern Europe all the way up until uh, the uh, Russian border. Uh, perhaps a central development there was the 2008 Bucharest NATO summit where the U.S. pushed its so-called allies, I think they're more like vassals, if you will, than <laughs> allies to the United States, exactly. and pushed onto the agenda that uh, both uh, uh, Georgia and Ukraine would be eventually brought into NATO. And I, I, I think at that point, the tensions between uh, Russia and the U.S. slash NATO uh, began to accelerate. Uh, in fact, the year before, in, uh, in 2007, in Munich, NATO had, no, it was uh, the Munich Security Conference is what it happened. It was a NATO-organized conference but uh, Putin was allowed to speak at that conference. And it was here that Russia made its first uh, very transparent public criticism of, uh, of NATO enlargement. And uh, this was a year before the Bucharest summit. Um, let's see, where was that? Cool. Basically, Putin, uh, I didn't copy it. Well, Putin asked at that summit, uh, why was there uh, this push for, you, uh, for NATO uh, to include uh, these Eastern European countries and why was it going up to its border? Uh, and he asked, what is this for? And I think he understood very clearly, and when I say he, we're talking about the Russian state and its political establishment, knew that the basic objective of NATO enlargement was eventually regime change in Russia, as I've described. Other events along that history would center around the 2004 um, coup d'etat, where uh, the United States and Germany played major roles in overthrowing the democratically elected government there and installing a ultra nationalist regime. Was that, it 214? Two, what did it say? Wait, four. Two, yeah, two, well, 2004 was a color revolution in Ukraine as well. But 2014, the US and Germany organized this coup where they put in place this ultra nationalist regime uh, with uh, aligned with uh, proto and neo fascist organizations like the Right Sector, the Svoboda. Uh, group uh, at the Azov Battalion and others. And from that moment on, they, they initiated a attack on the Russian speaking populations in Eastern Ukraine in the so-called so -called Donbass. Uh, the next perhaps event in that process was in 2015, the establishment of the Minsk agreements where uh, Germany, France, Russia and the Kiev regime sat down 
and made an agreement that there was going to be a political solution to the crisis. And the political solution was that Ukraine was not going to become a member of NATO and that Eastern Ukraine would have relative autonomy, uh, like a federal state, if you will, like the United States, in Ukraine. But we know now, we kind of guessed it as it was unfolding, but we know now categorically that Kiev resisted the implementation of the Minsk Accords. Germany and France also did that as well. Angela Merkel, once out of office, said that we never had the intent of implementing the Minsk Accords. Our objective was to give Ukraine, uh, Kiev, uh, the time to rearm to prepare for some kind of conflict with Russia. And maybe the third part of that history is from 214, certainly 215, the United States and NATO began to arm and train Kiev uh, uh, with, I think the term that strikes me most is this term interoperability, meaning to uh, provide weapons for Ukraine that would complement uh, NATO supplied weapons as well. And then maybe the third example here, or the next point in this line, is that throughout all of this, Putin tried to get the implementation of Minsk. Again, there was foot dragging. And then on December 17th, 2021, President Putin sent a letter to the EU as well as to the United States and he proposed a, a conference a, uh, to s establish a European security framework that would include Russia. Uh, that letter fell on deaf ears in Washington because the decision had already been made is that there was gonna be no co cooperation with Russia. Uh, maybe the next, next example on that uh, history is that uh, that winter, in December and January, the Kiev military began to mobilize along the, uh, this line right outside of Donbass and began to e escalate artillery shelling of the region. And it was by February, I think a decision was made, clearly, and maybe it was in January, that uh, Russia was going to intervene into uh, Ukraine uh, with several objectives. Uh, the media and our government has uh, failed to tell us uh, clearly what actually happened in this process. Uh, my, my understanding based on my research reading and listening to people that I have respect for, Scott Ritter is one of those people by the way, um, is that it's pretty clear that Russia went in with what, uh, 190,000 troops, something like that, and went, came in proximity to Kiev, not with the intent, and this is very important, not with the intent of uh, overthrowing the government, but to force the government into a political negotiations to come up with an agreement that was similar, if not identical, to the Minsk Accords. And what's very, very important is that uh, the, 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 the West, the U.S. was claimed, the U.S. media was claim, claiming that this is an attempt, this is Hitler invading Ukraine with the intent of taking over Ukraine, and this is the first step towards uh, eventually conquering the West, rest of Europe and all of this stuff, you know, which is actually not actually what was happening. What the goal was, uh, was to have these negotiations and these negotiations did take place between Zelensky and uh, Russia or the Kiev government. Uh, some of them were in Belarus and some of the negotiations were in, uh, in Istanbul and a settlement was basically reached in March of 2022. And uh, as you, I think some of you know this, if not all of you, is uh, the U.S. lackey, Boris, Boris uh, Britain, uh, Boris Johnson, 
uh, went to Kiev and told uh, Zelensky that he should not sign these accords is that US and NATO were going to support uh, uh, Ukraine to the very end, okay? So um, I think as a sidebar to this, uh, the war is a war that did not have to happen in the first place if the Minsk Accords had been um, implemented. And certainly if the US and NATO had allowed the implementation of this agreement in uh, March of 2022, there would not have been an escalation of the war. Uh, the tragedy of all of this is that Ukraine has been used as a sacrificial lamb by the United States. And uh, there's no clear, accurate understanding of how many Ukrainian troops have been killed. Uh, the numbers you read vary anywhere between, say, 200,000 to 500,000. Uh, if you want to believe uh, McGregor, Douglas McGregor, the number tends to be about 500,000, which is just uh, absolutely mind-boggling. Um, and and as, as this particular moment, uh, it's very clear that uh, even though the war continues along the so-called contact line, it, it, it's inevitable that Russia will prevail whatever form that takes. We could maybe comment on that if you have any questions later. Uh, let me back off and say what US's, US objectives were. Um, in 1991, as I said earlier, there was this objective of pursuing absolute global hegemony. Uh, and in 1992, um, there was a document, uh, a, a, a document, a, a policy document that was put together uh, called the uh, Defense Planning Guidance, uh, fiscal year 1994-1999, and it was uh, public. It was published or made public in April of 1992. We know this uh, document as the Wolfowitz Doctrine. And uh, if anyone wants, you can go Google this and find out the details of it. But this planning document, or this planning guidance, guidance was to more or less outline US foreign policy objectives, uh, strategic and tactical uh, options, and it's uh, and how to implement those objectives and at the core of this uh, document is uh, the essence of uh, u.s policy at least towards eurasia since 1992. Uh, let me read uh, a little bit of the wolfowitz doctrine the uh, wolfowitz doctrine says our first objective is to prevent the reemergence of a new rival, either on the territory of the former Soviet Union or elsewhere that poses a threat on the order of that posed formally by the Soviet Union. This is a dominant consideration underlying the new regional defense strategy and requires that we endeavor to prevent any hostile power from dominating a region whose resources would, under consolidated control, be sufficient to generate global power. I'm gonna read that one more time, because this is, this is, this distills uh, what, everything that's happened since 1992 is distilled in this, uh, these several sentences. <clears throat> Our first objective is to prevent the reemergence of a new rival, either on the territory of the former Soviet Union or elsewhere, that poses a threat on the order of that posed formally by the Soviet Union. This is a dominant consideration underlying 
the new regional defense strategy and requires that we endeavor to prevent any hostile power from dominating a region whose resources would under consolidated control be sufficient to generate global power. If we want to distill that into several words, the objective of the United States was to not allow the development of a peer competitor in Eurasia, okay? And all of the policies of the United States have been designed to achieve that goal. Now, who were the possible peer competitors in 1992? Uh, believe it or not, the only one was possibly a united Europe, okay? Although keep in mind that Europe, uh, uh, this was pre-NATO enlargement. So we're really basically talking about Western European countries that are under the rubric of NATO. They, they were still under NATO, but the EU was a potential uh, organization. I'm not gonna say it's achieved this goal by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a potential threat uh, to become a peer competitor, the, the competitor if it elected to break out of uh, the U.S. confines. Uh, and the major engine of that would be Germany, okay? And more specifically, what the fear was uh, on the part of the United States was that Germany might reorient itself towards the East like it had done twice before in world history, uh, World War I on the part of the Kaiser and <coughs> World War II on the part of uh, Hitler to try to gain access to markets, raw materials, et cetera, in Russia or the Soviet Union. And so the second fear on the part of the United States related to a possible peer competitor was Europe lining itself with uh, Soviet Union, actually Soviet Union was gone, George, uh, with Russia in 1991, 1992. And if that would happen, then that would be a power that might even be more powerful than the United States economically and, and, and militarily as well. Um, so, uh, but by the way, to kind of update this, uh, uh, actually, I'll, I'll say it another way. So the second, the next major possible peer competitor would be Russia. But in the 1990s, Russia was very weak, okay? Uh, with the disintegration of the Soviet Union and Russia becoming the successor state to uh, the nuclear arsenal, the military might of the Soviet Union and various economic resources. Uh, the, there was a possibility there, but Russia, during the shock therapy that the US and Europe implemented in Russia, the relative control that the US had over the Soviet, the Russian economy, excuse me, and the, um, uh, collaboration, if you will, with these new oligarchs that were being formed in the, this process of privatization and shock therapy, uh, it, it was pretty well felt in the night. And then you had Yeltsin, who was basically a comprador uh, leader, meaning he was in the U.S.'s back pocket. Uh, so Russia was really not perceived to be a threat in the 1990s. And it is in this context that Clinton began to push for a NATO enlargement. And we see the first, as they say, tranche of countries in 1999. Um, now, that all changed when Vladimir Putin came into power in 2000, okay? Not that Putin was a monster, but, uh, and he isn't a monster, by the way, just point of information. Uh, uh, That's a joke. He's murdered, he's murdered people. And he can't be trusted. And, and, and democ uh, let, let me, you uh, talk, NATO, hey, sir, sir, wait a minute. Sir, NATO, wait a sir, minute. Sir, NATO, sir. NATO means 
the EU, and the EU means democracy, and that's what Putin is afraid of, well, is democracy. Sir, <laughs> sir, you can have the floor when I'm well, finished. Well, okay? I'm going to leave, I think. Good. I, I've heard it's enough excellent. of this bullshit. I mean, you're, you're way really out, of, out of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, uh, okay, well, um, and you didn't mention Crimea. He took Crimea in the 2014. You know, he can't be trusted. He sent in his undercover agents, no uniform. I mean, come on. Hey, they voted. It's, it's, you're too, yeah, it's too much. I can't take this. You're distorting the history. It's, 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 called, re, it's called revisionist history, sir. Um, I'm not going to say it's the truth. But it's, yeah. Never mind. Um, so uh, in 1999, Putin came, was, was selected by Yeltsin, ironically, and then was elected president. Uh, what's interesting about Putin, his, the government, okay, was one, I, Putin said there are three points. One, he insisted that Russia was part of Europe, too, and it wanted to be part of Europe and cooperate with Europe. Secondly, uh, Putin actually lobbied to have Russia join NATO, okay, yeah. uh, which many people don't know. And obviously that was something that the United States wasn't gonna entertain at all. And thirdly, and this is always the reason why the US targets countries for destabilization and covert or overt intervention is that in contrast to the 1990s, the Putin government uh, demanded that the West respect Russia's national interests and respect its national sovereignty. And fourthly, that the Russians were going to control their own economy and not be linked and, and trapped by the United States' uh, neoliberal agenda and the uh, policies of the IMF, the World Bank, and all of these institutions that actually create indebt indebtedness to countries that are trapped by this apparatus. And I would argue that was his biggest crime, was the demanding that uh, Russia controls its own economy. So by 1990, 19, no, by 2003 or four was, was when I began to see the beginnings of the demonization in the media of Putin, which obviously continues to this very moment. And this young man just left, an old man, I guess, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, still subscribes to this view. Uh, uh, the, uh, the next particular potential peer competitor uh, was uh, in 1992, could have possibly, possibly been China. But China really didn't emerge as the threat, if you will, the economic threat until the early 2000s. And in fact, if you listen to even John Mersheimer in many of his discussions, uh, where he's outstanding on U Ukraine, he's pretty shit poor, by the way, on, on China, because his argument was that the U.S. should have never allowed China to become a member of the World Trade Organization. Uh, now, keep in mind that the U.S. felt at that time in promoting this membership that they could manage China, and China would be a willing junior partner to the U.S.'s uh, global hegemony and its pursuit of global hegemony. But by, um, again, the dates are, are kind of rough to find exactly what day that, that this happened. I would argue the beginnings of this push towards a multipolar world order started in the early 2000s. I think we see the beginnings of the new Cold War on the part of the United States, and I think the demonization of Putin 
it kind of personifies that. It started somewhere around 24, 25, 26. Uh, if you read some of the work of the great Stephen Cohen, uh, he, he begin he lays out the outlines of this uh, this uh, new Cold War that started about that time. One of the unfortunate things uh, related to having sources of information and wisdom was that uh, uh, Cohen died, uh, what, in 220, I guess, 221. And uh, he was a, a, a valuable uh, observer of uh, US, Russia, for that matter, US Soviet policies before 1991. Um, but again, somewhere between two, the early 2000s and 2014, 2015, what you see is uh, the beginnings of uh, these objective peer competitors, competitors to the United States. I'm going to approach this a little differently than I planned to. Um, in uh, 1992, as I said, we had the Wolfowitz Doctrine. In, in 2002, uh, there was another a strategic doctrine implemented by the United States as guidelines for its foreign policy, and that was something called National Security Strategy Memorandum. 2002, which came to us known as the Bush Doctrine. Okay, that's that's uh, Bush two, and basically that was the uh, coining of the of the uh, war on terror, if you will. That's to justify the war on terror and the assaults on uh, on Iraq in particular, and you could say Libya and Syria on that uh, list as well. Um, the key to uh, the National Security Strategy Memorandum 2002 was uh, preemption. It was justified to use preemption to intervene into a country to prevent a war. And that was the case built up around the, war, uh, the weapons of mass destruction related to uh, Iraq in the early 2000s. Uh, 2002 certainly and in 2003 obviously there were no weapons of mass destruction I think the the lesson is that if and, and some of some people knew this at the time certainly Scott Ritter knew it at the time and some of my colleagues and I knew it or understood it at the time if Iraq had had weapons of mass destruction the US would not have intervened okay <laughs> Yep. They intervened because they did not have weapons of mass destruction, okay? Which is why, uh, you know, some countries want weapons of mass destruction, and that's to be a check on U.S. intervention. What I'm trying to do is get quick, get up to the, the more current realities, and that is that in 2018, there was another uh, strategic doc doc doctrine or document that was put forth uh, and this is the third major doctrine or, or strategic doctrine uh, since the end of the Cold War. And this is the national defense strategy of the United States. And uh, the, uh, the, the actual title of it is uh, Sharpening the American Military's Competitive Edge. I mean, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty blunt related to its objectives. Uh, fundamentally, what's significant about the national defense strategy of the United States uh, sharpening the American military's competitive edge is that it changed its strategy or its targeted countries. The 2002 Bush Doctrine targeted countries that house terrorism, okay? and it targeted terrorism. Now it shifted its position to targeting peer competitors. Okay, that's the language within the strategic doctrine. Um, peer competitors economically or peer competitors 
militarily? Well, I, I think the Wolfowitz Doctrine says it. It has a combination of economic power and military power, which also gives it geopolitical influence and leverage as well, okay? So it's a combination of, of all of those things. By North Korea. Pardon? By North Korea. No, North Korea would not be a pure competitor. No, 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 not at all. That's no. The, the only countries that could be are Europe, Russia, and China. The only countries that are pure competitors since the last 10 years or so are Russia and China. Let me read a, a portion of this. You can find these documents online, by the way. Or, by the way, I'm no longer nervous, by the way. <laughs> it's like the 49ers offense today. <laughs> yeah, the, in, yeah, in the second quarter. You know, they were nervous the first quarter, but then they, they got rolling. Be, being competitors due to the economics for Russia and China? Pardon? Being competitors for for a uh, the the danger of a competition yep. for yep. Russia and China is it really primarily because of their chance of the economics really? Oh, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's, it's economic primary, isn't it? Yeah. For Versus example, a defense or yeah. a military. Yeah, huh? well, eventually when a smaller country like Iran, could have a nuclear weapon set up, right. yeah. but they don't have the economics of... Well, they do uh, have oil, they do have oil, and it's it's valuable, but it's not on the level of a Russia or a China, okay? Yeah. 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 Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an integrated world system, and, it, and it's a very fluid, dynamic process as well, the, the obvious is, uh, you know, the contours we've already described, the U.S. is the hegemon at 45, bipolar world, 91, unipolar, now multipolar, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very fluid world as well. Um, they, they, we're going to get to the Middle East eventually in this discussion, and what, what we're going to talk about is, uh, you know, the Gaza war. Oh my God, I wish I could start this right now, but I want to continue this to get to that. <laughs> I'm going to continue this and get to that, okay? But, uh, rem uh, but let, me, let me say this, because it's, you have to have the, the, the context, and you have, none of this is planned, you guys. It's not spontaneous. The, the U.S., this is all calculated, okay? You have a foreign policy establishment, okay, that, consists of, of, of policy planning organizations, of think tanks like the RAND Corporation, for example. Um, for example, related to Russia, 2017, the RAND Corporation published a report entitled Overextending and Unbalancing Russia, Assessing the Impact of Cost-Imposing Options, okay? The Rand Corporation works for the Pentagon, okay? You can walk, I could read some of this stuff, and it just tells, tells you how do we undermine Russia, okay? And then how do you implement this and translate it into public policy? And then it's carried out by the State Department, okay? That's what I'm trying to, what I, my goal is tonight, is to try to show that it's not something you just see on the headlines on the television on a given night or on or in, or in, uh, in the newspapers. It, it's a, it, there's a system here, and, it, and it's, a, it's calculated in many ways. There's an imperative uh, that operates in all of this. But let me read part of this uh, national defense strategy of the U.S. The na this, there, this is a 58-page document, by the way, but I'm just taking a couple short paragraphs to give you the essence of this document. The national defense strategy acknowledges an increasing complex global security environment characterized by overt challenges to the free and open international order. Now, free and open 
are code words, okay, for capitalist exploitation, okay? Remember John Hay in 1898, okay? And the U.S. was kind of, you know, stretching its muscles and was beginning to fight against the Spanish in the Pacific and it was taking Hawaii and Guam and the Philippines and the big powers were of raping literally of China. And John Hay, the Secretary of State, wrote the famous open door notes, okay? <laughs> Meaning we want an open door for us too, okay? So um, William Appleman Williams, the great William Appleman Williams as a historian has written many uh, number of important books about the idea of the open door uh, on the part of US policy and US foreign policy. So when they're talking about challenges to the free and open international order, meaning access to raw materials and markets that are unconstrained, but access that we don't want a competitor to, okay? We don't want to bargain, we want to have total access and control. And that's, that's one of the, the issues when you look at tar countries that are targeted for US military intervention in the last 45 to 50 or 60 years, uh, these countries are willing to trade with the United States, but they just don't want the United States to control, control their economies, okay? Russia would like to trade, okay? Uh, but that isn't enough. There also is this objective of controlling the economies as well. So anyway, uh, uh, this uh, new security environment characterized by overt challenges to the free and open international order and the reemergence of long-term strategic competition between nations. These changes require a clear-eyed appraisal of threats we face, acknowledgement of the changing character of the warfare and transformation of how the department of defense conducts business. The central challenge to U.S. prosperity and security is the reemergence of long-term strategic competition by what the national security strategy classifies as revisionist powers. Revi that's another term that is commonly used, revisionist powers. It is increasingly clear that China and Russia want to shape a world consistent with their authoritarian model, gaining veto authority over other nations, economic, diplomatic, and security decisions. What that means is that they want, they're, they're claiming that China and Russia wants to do what we want to do, <laughs> is what they're claiming, okay? And the, the document goes on and on, and it lays out uh, strategic and tactical options to deal with this, and I would argue uh, the, 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 the goal, the next point I want to make is if hindsight is excellent, okay, but if you also have an idea of where the world is headed, when you get to hindsight, you can look back and say, hey, I was correct about what I felt was happening. But here, here's the strategy related to those peer competitors, Europe, uh, Russia and, and China. I call it the the Eurasian project is what I call it. Okay, Be, uh, and, and by the way, the Gaza story is fitting into what I call the Middle East project. Okay, on the part of the United States, but the a Eurasian project is to prevent Eurasian integration. Okay, and. Over the, last, over the last 15 or 20 years, the engine, there are two separate interrelated engines of this integration. One is the Chinese economy, okay? George, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Could you repeat that it's to prevent the Eurasian? Uh, yeah, to prevent Eurasian. the Eurasian integration, okay? okay? Meaning the integration of, uh, of uh, the Eurasian marketplace its infrastructure, whether that's uh, transport or whether it's telecommunication 
and obviously integration of political, cultural, and social cooperation as well. Okay. Okay. Pardon? But they've done that. Who's who's done that? Eurasia has has done that. That's what I'm I'm, I'm going to say. That yes, yes. It, it's it's, it's already underway. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and, and it's making great headway as well. I'm not driven by China. The other element of this is the energy sources, natural gas and oil that exists in Eurasia, particularly Russia and areas around the Caspian Sea as well. So uh, the, the goal of the U.S. by the way, this, uh, excuse me, this integration uh, it's driven by the Chinese has to do with the Belt Road Initiative, or, uh, which is a infrastructural project yeah. to integrate uh, Eurasia all the way from Vladivostok to Lisbon, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, rail uh, and maritime linkages, as well as uh, broadband and telecommunication. Yeah. Uh, also, Infra uh, uh, development banks like the Asian Infrastructure yeah. Development Bank is a project, is an example, which is a counter hegemonic institution to the World Bank, which the US controls, and the Chinese control this bank. The difference is on the World Bank or the IMF, when loans or grants are provided, there are concessions that governments have to uh, implement to enable them to get the loans or grants. For example, if the World Bank is going to loan a country in the third world a certain amount of money, they have to promise that they're going to privatize their infrastructure, their, their irrigation system, their water services, their yes. transport system, etc. And who are they going to provide? privatize those systems to U.S. or European corporations, okay? So the U.S. corporations or the European corporations will own the infrastructure and, and facilities and services in those countries. The Chinese are not re requiring these kinds of concessions to these various loans. And they, the, the, their philosophy is something called win-win, okay? We'll develop, we'll, we'll build a port, we'll build an airport, uh, we'll build a hydroelectric facility or whatever, and uh, you know, we'll trade with you. you can, it'll benefit you and it'll benefit us in the long haul, okay? So these are things that are happening. The, the Russians uh, have a, a, Eur, a Eurasian uh, uh, development bank as well that fits into this, this structure. Uh, uh, and, and then you have the BRICS, uh, the BRICS structure. Uh, well, no, actually, before that, you have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization is another Eurasian infrastructure that is involved with political, economic cooperation uh, of Eurasia. And, and this stuff is this is happening overnight. I mean, you could go back 25 years ago. And very little of it existed, but it's it's happening rapidly. Peg, you yeah, want to say well, something? When I was there, they talked about Tugwell. Tugwell was in the FDR administration. Rex, Rexford Tugwell. Huh? Rexford Tug Tugwell. Tugwell. Yeah. Tugwell. Yeah. And the, the the plans for what they were doing in the development also in Laos, they said the same thing. Tugwell. And that it is is from his writings that they came up with these plans. Mm -hmm. And um, when you're done, I, I, okay. I just want a, a couple sure. minutes to sure. talk okay. about. Sure. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Yes. When you say that uh, China makes these loans and they um, put in power plants, et cetera, et cetera, the countries own them after they've been? Yes, 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 yes. yes. So, so yes. it's just an exchange for trade. Yeah, exchange yeah. for trade. Yeah, exactly. Sounds yeah, no like concession. Deal for the country. Pardon? Yeah. Sounds like a whole lot better deal. Right, 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 right. Well, that's, well, that, that's <laughs> what's that's why if you wonder why there's so many wars and why there's an urgency in these wars is 
it's rooted in the recognition on the part of the United States is that its days are numbered, okay, as the world power, okay? And because this is happening rapidly, all right? And, uh, and it's trying to prevent this from happening. And the problem is that these wars that are being fought, that are being provoked by the United States, Ukraine, could have been a political solution. We're not going to allow that. There could be a polit should have been could have been a political political solution related to Palestine. Even yeah. you know if the U.S. really had the political will and for that matter the ability to do it. Uh, so uh, what is the U.S. Uh, investment in the war now in Gaza and all and West Bank? What, well, I mean it's all about military spending and and benefits to the arms industries and, and uh, the banks where the U.S. borrows money from banks to, uh, and then the money that the U.S. gets from the banks, then they buy the weapons and then out of the U.S. budget, our debt gets bigger. But there's no strategic interest that I can see. Natural debt. Well, oh, except for a bringer of Israel. Oh, Gene said that they they discovered. Well, God was sitting on a huge natural gas. Well, yeah, well, I'll, I'll get to this. Sorry. I'll get to, I'll yeah. get to all this. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'd like to continue. I'd just like to see yeah, the information. Yeah, because it'll get. Yeah, go ahead. Let I'm me sorry. make one final point, and then we can open it up for some questions, okay? The, the, uh, the goal is on the part of the United States, and this strategic document basically tells you that's what they want to do. Uh, that, <coughs> What you you have to wait. There are three things that they're basically trying have tried to do. One is to sever Europe's economic energy relationships with yes. Russia. Yes. Number one. Okay. Blowing up Nord Stream one and two, for example. Okay. Forcing Europe to put sanctions on Russia because they intervene um, into Ukraine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the first objective. I, uh, and part of that objective is a political and economic suicide for Germany, okay? I just spent a month in Germany last summer, and I can attest to you the conversations I've had with people about what's actually happening in Germany. Uh, now, later I could comment on exactly why the German ruling class would allow this to happen. Yeah. It is divided, by the way, on these points. Um, the, uh, the second objective is to do what I said earlier, is to provoke a war uh, with Russia over Ukraine, which would uh, commit Russia to a war that the U.S. was continually escalating with the hope from the American point of view that it would break the Russian economy it, it, and uh, it would create conditions where either the masses would rise up and overthrow the regime or that the elites, either in the bureaucracy and the political establishment or the economic elites, would demand and find a way to have a coup to overthrow Putin. Remember when Prashigan uh, had this alleged coup? The, the American media, that for a couple of days, they went ape shit over this, you know? <laughs> Pazigan's gonna overthrow Putin, yay! They went crazy, you know? Uh, because this is their wet dream, pardon my use of these languages. Okay, but that hasn't happened. And the third objective is to dismantle Russia into smaller countries, okay? And you can, if you don't believe me, there are actual conferences and reports that have been done. There was a, a conference last year on Capitol Hill discussing how to dismantle Russia. And they have actually maps that they've drawn and they've set up all the different countries that would exist, etc. This is not fantasy on my part. The fantasy is that they actually believe they can do this, okay? Yeah. That's the fantasy. And, and uh, certainly they have failed in that objective in Russia. Russia is stronger than it's ever been since the end of the Cold War. Its military has, has, has become a strength. It's probably the most effective, most well-trained military in the entire world now. 
which is a threat to U.S. interests, okay, although the Russians are not going to invade Europe or Russia or, or the United States at all. And uh, its economic trade is, is blossoming, and most of the world uh, has not adhered to U.S. Uh, policies towards Russia. They have not accepted applying sanctions on Russia and are willing to cooperate. And if you just look at the, the myriad of conferences and delegations that go to Moscow all the time to meet with President Putin, with uh, the foreign ministry, uh, et cetera, to work out these, comp these cooperative plans for the eventual completion of this uh, Eurasian integration. The third uh, objective is to break China. Okay? And the, the model there is the Ukrainian model. If you militarize U uh, uh, Taiwan like the US militarized Ukraine, you might create a condition that would provoke uh, China to react, which would justify the US to use the Ukraine-Russia model immediately implement massive sanctions against the Chinese economy, try to isolate China geopolitically around the world, and then to arm Taiwan to uh, foster an accelerated, escalated war. That is the goal, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Now, what I would argue, if you look at these three components, uh, they've been fairly, they've been Somewhat, they've been almost completely successful in Europe. They have severed Germany's relations with uh, Russia quite effectively, <coughs> certainly in the er energy areas. There are still some German and European companies operating in, in uh, Russia, but it, it's not of a great significance at this point. Related to breaking Russia, they have failed to do that. And at the same time, They've created this horrible, it's disgusting what the U.S. has done related to Ukraine, in my mind. It has destroyed a country, okay? Literally destroyed a country that didn't have to happen, okay? And then the third scenario is, um, hasn't happened yet, and that's a war with China. And uh, I don't have a crystal ball to determine what scenarios can unfold there. Uh, the problem is if you have a wounded uh, uh, beast in a China shop, uh, they're, they're going to continue to strike out. And I would argue that's basically the position of the United States at this point. Uh, the, the, the interesting re development there, though, is, and I, I commented on this uh, last time we met, is that this war over Gaza opened up uh, the, the, the U.S., the, the realities, the reality of U.S. foreign policy uh, globally, and it's also uh, split and rip, ripped open the Democratic Party, and for that matter, even the Biden administration and members of the executive branch. And so I do not believe the U.S. is going to turn its stripes by any stretch of imagination but the domestic political scene has been affected by this quite quite dramatically as well. Okay. Um, Interesting. A couple, you had a question and then Stacy. I don't, it was passed, it's okay. Okay, yes, yeah, Stacy. I would think that China would be, okay, I'm using this euphemistically, but delighted that the U.S. is busy in Ukraine and busy in the Gaza because that gives them, you know, it, it, it's their eyes are not on China. I mean, they, you can only focus on so many things at once. And this is a perfect opportunity for China to continue to build its belt away and uh, et cetera. Yeah, I, I would, that's, that's a good observation, but I, I would uh, slightly disagree with that in the sense that there are provocations in the South China Sea every single day by yeah. U.S. military ships trying to provoke an incident with China, okay? 
Yeah, I mean, it, there might have been one or two today, okay? It happens all the time. Overflights by planes going into and, Chinese. And the drone attacks that happened today, that was in the Red Sea, right? I, I didn't hear about this. On, uh, on, yeah. uh, on, on a couple of military warships. US. By Yemen. By Yemen, yes. Well, that, that's related to the Middle East story. Okay, okay. that's that's about China per se. It's hard to keep up. It's hard to keep up, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, one quick, yes, yes, yes. I have a question. I thought Russia's economy, I thought California's <coughs> economy was bigger than Russia's. Yeah. Yeah. GDP. She, she thought that California's that economy was larger than Russia. Larger than the Russian economy. Yeah. No, not, not even close. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the U.S., and I'm going to use that as an euphemism for the establishment order here. Uh, and they went into this Ukraine war believing that Russia was weak, okay, uh, militarily and economically, and that they could isolate Russia geopolitically. Uh, but the Russian economy is, is, is actually grown during this war, okay, yeah. Yes. I'm wondering why, what our connection is that's so powerful with, with Israel, especially, uh, you know, they can even uh, control or attempting to control what students are doing when they demonstrate against what Israel is doing. And of course, we know that that's called anti feminism, which we know it isn't. Uh, but, um, you know, we say how awful it is because, you know, we think that Russia might be interfering in our government operations or China, and yet we, Russia, pretty, Israel rather, seems to pretty well control us. And, um, yeah, well, it's true. <laughs> it's so true. how is it that they have so much power over us? Well, it's called money, and it's okay. called blackmail and intimidation. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's called running the candidacies of camp yes. uh, uh, yeah. candidates for political office yes. and uh, holding them up for economic and personal oh, yeah. uh, blackmail. I mean, it's a whole mafia-run apparatus, okay? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll show you, uh, as a sidebar of this, I, I can no longer support the Dallas Mavericks because I heard this week that the Adelson family bought the Dallas Mavericks from Mark Cuban oh, really? oh, sold for $3.5 billion. Oh, yeah. wow. And the uh, Adelson family gave, gave Trump, uh, they were the number one donor, donor to Trump in 220, by the way. Um, also, why do the German, uh, German government, why do they continue to, to uh, go along with us? Because we just, Really hurting their industry badly with, uh, you know, bombing, destroying the the, the um, pipeline. From, so, if you you said you were going to talk about. Uh, well, there's there's a couple factors. One, Germany is an occupied country. Okay. I know. There's, uh, I think, 30,000 U.S. troops in, in, in Germany, okay? Right. So it's, it's, it's a semi-colony of the United States on that level. Uh, certain economic interests, basically in the area of finance capital, so the split in Germany is between finance and manufacturing, okay? And, and so finance is linked to the transatlantic uh, project, which is the, the U.S. Uh, project that we've been describing. Right. The manufacturing interests would be more willing to be cooperative with uh, Russia. Under Merkel, they were able to kind of walk this tightrope yes. where with the war, in the Ukraine war, the lines have been drawn. Uh, and and I, I would also argue that if you guys know of the uh, Berlin Conference of 1884, 1885. The Berlin Conference uh, was held over the world, summer, winter of 84, 85, uh, uh, organized by uh, Otto von Bismarck. And at that conference, the imperialist powers went and figuratively sat, on, sat at a table with a blank map of Africa. 
and the U.S. was there as well, and they literally carved Africa up for the big powers, okay? And France could have this part, Germany could have this part, Britain could have this part, Portugal you can keep, and Gold and Mozambique. What is what 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 this what this war that I've just described between a Eurasian integration by, by Eurasians versus the U.S. trying to prevent that is if the U.S. wins, the prize is grand. Okay, raw materials, oil natural gas, markets, everything, okay? So there's, there's kind of, the, the German ruling class that I described is linked to the United States, but it also is licking its chops that if we prevail, we're gonna get really rich, okay? And so that is part of what keeps this alliance going at this point. Uh, and, and because they're going to get part of Russia is what they well, say. Well, yeah, uh, when, yeah, I'm not going to say they're going to have a map and divide it all up, but yeah. they've had conferences over the reconstruction of Ukraine, for example, already. Okay, the war's not over yet, and my guess is the Russians are going to determine the outcome of that war, not the U.S. or the EU. Okay, uh, but. They are going to share if if they prevailed over Ukraine, you know the, the agricultural uh, resources there, for example, hydroelectric resources, et cetera, et cetera. The the privatization of all of these things. So that that's part of what we're dealing with. But to understand that, you have to go to the essence of what capitalism is about. Okay. And that is that capitalism exhausts. It has a propelling industry, okay, that is where you, that is invested in and it creates profit. Mm -hmm. But there is this point in capitalism where there's a falling rate of profit, okay, and so you have to either retool that industry or that commodity to shine it up and make it more marketable, or you need another industry, okay. Uh, to develop. It was steel in the railroad, and then it was the automobile, and now it's telecommunications, okay? And when that is get, when that gets exhausted, where do you go? And that's really what we're talking about here, is, is this imperative that a hegemon, a capitalist hegemon has, an imperialist state, is that when it constantly needs new territories to profit from, Okay, and and that's what drives the war. Is what I mean. There are many other factors. Obviously, the arms industry. You need a threat to manufacture <coughs> weapons and all that. But it's really about the, the the need for new investment opportunities. So, if, if China were to become the new hegemon, what would be its what would drive it? What would keep it there? <coughs> Well, first of it all, well, it is a capitalist system, but it, it, it's a different form of capitalist system, it, 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 even in a cultural sense, okay? Uh, I, I, this isn't exactly the way to answer the question, but uh, back in 91, I went to Tokyo to see the World Track and Field Championships, and I had a Japanese student at Chico State, and she invited me to come to her father's house, parents' house for dinner. And her father was a big time capitalist, okay? He was an import exporter. And I had a wonderful evening that night. And after the dinner and, and the drinks, we sat around and talked. And he asked, How come your country, you go, if you don't get a profit with one quarter, you're going to leave? You know, exactly. we cultivate markets, okay? And we take time, we take losses before we get profit, et cetera. So it's a different kind of capitalism. And again, as the Chinese say, it's win-win. Uh, in the short haul, we might not make a big profit, but if we have stability over a long period of time, we're going to continue to make profit in all of this. 
But American capitalism doesn't function that way. It's, it's a greedy capitalism as well, okay? Um, but the point I want to make about China as the next hegemon, I don't think China has the aspirations to be the next hegemon. I don't think it wants to be the next hegemon. And I don't think it has the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 no, no, the yeah. air, wherewithal, the, I mean, the, the military and the ships and, I mean, China had a, when was it, uh, 1421? China had the possibility to be the global hegemon. And, and it just went back home and tore its ships up, you know? <laughs> It's I mean, that's a different kind of worldview, is what it's that is. Confusion. They, they yeah, Confucian. Yeah, Confucian. Yeah, exactly. How, how does democracy fit the in? The first all time this? I ran into Chinese, quote, imperialism was in Kyrgyzstan. They were already getting oil from Kazakhstan. I mean, they even have a small border with Kazakhstan. And that was when I first ran into this weird little. Thing that had Tugwell's picture on the front, but I couldn't read the inside because it was in Kazakh and Kyrgyz. And basically, it was read for me, and it said, it, the, pa the pamphlet was called Even in America. And it described, if we make you wealthy, and if we pull you up to a good, you know, a producing country, it's good for us. Yeah. And I saw, when I went to Laos, they were afraid of China, but same, the same, the same bloody pamphlet in Laotian <laughs> with Todd Wells picture on it. You're kidding. <laughs> Even America, and they built roads, they built fast train lines, China has, <coughs> and schools and medical centers, everywhere they go. Go, they build medical centers. And at first they send in Chinese doctors and then they train the, train the local people. When the Americans went into Kazakhstan, this was under Yeltsin, and we, we privatized everything. I mean, we had all these guys coming, Reuben, all of them, and they privatized the, the uh, utilities that unheard of. You know, and people were freezing. They didn't know they had to pay for the, the utilities. <laughs> Never had that. They privatized the hospitals, and that, and they took away the social security. And I saw people in, in Bish, Bishkek, women out there begging for money. And I, one woman that I used to give money to, she keeled over and died in the snow. Oh, no. And I was still in Kyrgyzstan when Putin came to power and Yeltsin went out. I don't care where he got his money. It took him less than a week to reinstate Social Security. And the rumor was he used his own money. I mean, people were dying because of this. And, and they hated it. The individuals hated it. Whatever capitalism is, we don't want it. And so that, that was the difference. But I mean, this weird Good old, good old Rex. Uh, yeah, yeah, but would you um, restate your question? Yeah, um, the countries that work on the socialist model, you know, we ostensibly have freedom, of democracy. Admittedly, we're kind of brainwashed because we can't seem to turn things to the people's best interest. But I don't see these countries like Russia, China, really people can dissent in a way that's safe. You know, people dissent, but they usually end up, you know, not in a very good place. And well, so, maybe, maybe not. We, you know, there's a, there is a propaganda machine that wants to paint <coughs> these countries as badly as possible. I went to the Soviet Union in 1983 for a couple of weeks, and when I got back to LA, my mother, who was still alive at the time, I said, Mom, I went to the Soviet Union. She said, well, what are you going to protest if you live there, you know? You're going to have to find something. The, the, 
Huh? No, she was just kidding. No, I'm kidding. Uh, the, the issue of democracy is, is a loaded issue, okay? Uh, and we're, this, this whole model now, Bush Jr. comes in and it was the war on terror, and now Biden comes in and it's, it's democracy versus, uh, 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 what is it? Authoritarianism, Authoritarianism or whatever. Um, the, how should I put it? Well, for example, elections, okay? Yeah, well, well our, the, the, first of all, the United States does not have a, it has a capitalist democracy, okay? Oh, it has a bourgeois democracy. Sure, sure. Okay, the capitalist system, the capitalists determine the political agenda, it determines who the candidates are, mm -hmm. it determines public policy, and it determines the outcome of public policy, okay? And, and the American public has the choice to vote for whomever they tell us that we're going to vote for, okay? That we should vote for, and and when it looks like there may be some differences related to social policy between the Republicans and Democrats, but if you look at it over the last, since what nineteen late sixties, there fundamentally isn't much difference. They both support neoliberalism, deregulation, privatization breaking unions and uh, and cutting social welfare, social programs, okay? It's to what degree and how quickly they do that. Both would like to privatize social security. The Democrats don't say it, the Republicans advocate it, et cetera. So there's really no basic difference, okay? Um, so I don't think the United States or even European models are, real examples of democracy where people have input in the, I'll get you in a second, in the decision-making process, okay? Yeah, um, I, I just don't see it in the, you know, in socialism, yeah, I can see it in theory, you can have that. But I just haven't seen examples in the world where that's been a reality. Um, well, my, my, I'm gonna be, this, this, I may, all my credibility as a Marxist and a socialist might go out the window when I say this, but I would prefer to have a benevolent dictator than a capitalist democracy to live under, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because what it's really about, I think the next point I want to make, this may make it clear, is these so-called socialist countries or capitalist countries Part of why there is the kind of controls that have existed in these countries is because these countries are being targeted by imperialism to be overthrown. And if they, if these countries had space to where they weren't on the defense as, as they have been and are, there would be the possibility of more room yeah for openness in these societies, okay? Um, and, and so when I look at, a, I've, been, I've been to Cuba, I've been to Soviet Union, and I've been to East Germany, okay? And I, this summer, I spend most of my time with my East, former East German friends, okay? And um, so I have a slight personal observation of all of this. But what, Peg, you're messing me up. <laughs> I'm trying to turn it off and I can't do that. I'm not trying to defend any system here, whether it's Soviet or Russia or, uh, and I've been to Russia as well, uh, or Cuba or whatever. But what I, what I know for a fact is that all of these societies have done, done their darndest to provide free housing, free education, free health care, okay, and guaranteed jobs, okay? I, I guarantee you, I have three or four friends in Berlin that grew up in East Germany. I spent a lot of time with them this summer. Not one of them, if they had an opportunity 
to go back to live in a, in a East Germany would say no, okay? Because of the security they felt, okay? And the cultural and aesthetic opportunities in the areas of the arts that they had opportunity to. Now, they will tell you that at home they would criticize the government, but they would not at a restaurant talk too loud about the government, yeah. okay? But basically, that they knew that they weren't going to go in the streets and demand that the government be overthrown, okay? But they didn't really have any material reasons for that, okay? To want the government to be overthrown. The problem, and I was kind of there when this all happened in the late, uh, in, in, in the late 80s and 90s, is uh, in some ways the irony was that uh, the goods in the West just were shinier, okay? Uh, I used to tell my East German friends if they'd only put in a Costco in East Berlin, it would have never been a revolution, okay? Because all they wanted were VCRs and stuff. And I don't want to make little, I'm not trying to make a little of this, okay? This is a fundamental issue. And I think this is one of the problems of our era, this debate. Um, uh, because one of the problems that we're dealing with on a, on a big, big level is we're also facing the challenge to the Enlightenment, okay? Yeah. The end of the Enlightenment, uh, anti-science, okay? Yeah. And the fascism that exists in the world, and Trump represents fascism, there's no debate about that. Uh, real fascism, by the way. Uh, and, and so in, in the midst of that, what is important, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm not going to say what my answers are right now, but th th this, these, these are parts of really big questions. And, and what, how do you balance uh, material security related to uh, political democracy, okay? Um, it's, it's, in this country, you can vote, but you can also starve to death at the same time, okay? And how do, you reckon, how do you resolve that difference? My only thing I can, after 72 years, is just there's no political system that's the answer. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, theoretically, theoretically, I'll, I'll get you guys in mean, reality. This guy <laughs> comes next. Okay. The, 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 here's, where, here's where it gets into the theoretical level, and that is a, a Stalinism <laughs> versus Trotskyism, okay? Stalin believed in socialism in one country, okay? Trotsky believed the only way to have socialism is permanent revolution, okay? Mm -hmm. And that is, one, that is still the big debate within the, the, the realm of social change. And which is, Grant, is Gramsci your field or your... With Gramsci? Yeah, because someone told me that was your... Oh, yeah, I... I where, is, where is that in those two? I, Gramsci has a strategy for how to achieve socialism uh, that is, is not... Mar uh, Leninism is Marxist-Leninism, meaning a, a vanguard political party. Um, Trotsky promotes, you know, similar kinds of revolutionary processes. Uh, Gramsci is about how to develop socialism through establishing consensus, okay? Meaning ideological hegemony. The, 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 the reality of the United States is that we're all subject to uh, capitalist, liberal, patriotic, uh, uh, ideology, okay? Consumer, uh, yeah, we're really caught up in a consumer ideology yeah. mm -hmm. and, and a transactional ideology, okay? And, and Because that's the dominant hegemonic ideology. And it's promoted on every level, media. I mean, you can turn the television. I used to, t when I taught classes, uh, freshman classes at Chico State, especially in the 80s, after about three or four weeks, some kid would right, jump up and say, you're brainwashing me, you're brainwashing me. And I said, how can I brainwash you? I've only had you for three weeks. 
and you've had 10,000 commercials, you know? <laughs> uh, so that, that, that is the ideology. Gramsci's proposing how you create alternative ideologies that are more humane, more equitable, more just. And he has a, strate a strategy related to uh, war of position, passive revolution, all those kinds of things. Um, but my basic feeling, I don't subscribe to, in I subscribe to whatever works, okay? <laughs> I'm not linked to any one position. Yes, sir, I'm sorry to keep you so long. Okay, um, it's actually related to what he was saying, because I, 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 it appears to me that um, our country uh, is very, very concerned about authoritarian governments mm -hmm. more than... As it becomes authoritarian. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, okay, yeah. but as, as he's pointing out, I understand that our democracy is not perfect, but mostly we have democracy. I mean, perfect democracy? No, we don't have that. But mostly we have a democracy. I, the, the, our government seems to be most scared of other countries that are autocracies, autocratic sorts of Yeah, they're not afraid of those governments. What, they're, what they don't like about those governments is not democracy. Because if we were so concerned about other countries having authoritarian governments, mm -hmm. we would not have supported all of those right-wing dictators in Central America for all those years, or okay? Or, or, the, or the Philippines, et cetera, or dictators in Africa. We're not against authoritarianism, okay? Keep that in mind. We're against governments that want to control their own economies. That's what we're against, okay? That's what we're against, okay? The Russians will trade with us, but we cannot control them. The Chinese will trade with us, but we cannot dominate their banking system. Okay, it's as simple as that. Okay, that's what what and we use authoritarianism as a label to justify our military uh, objectives of overthrowing those governments. Okay, so it, it's 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 a game. It's a trick they're playing on us. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, John, your turn. I just want to respond here. Well, we'll take Cuba for example. Mm -hmm. Very socialist and authoritarian, if you will. But the reason they're still driving around with 1950s cars and stuff like that, because U.S. had dominated the boycott issue. And, and Cuba loved to trade with everybody in the world. But U.S. has used its economic power, political power, military power, and everything else to convince everybody in the world, do not trade with Cuba. Imagine if Cuba, did not have that global boycott against them, mm -hmm. what kind of island would that be now? Yeah. I can never only assume, assume it would be a lot better than it is right now. Right? Mm -hmm. And to be more of a democracy, if you will. But because they're under constant threat by the US, special ops, the CIA, mm -hmm. they have to keep their guards up. Right. And well, that's, that's where, like, there's never been a, a true socialist revolution because there have been four outside forces forcing that the socialist countries for revolution but to be more authoritarian and that calling in and all that stuff. Hitler, Hitler, I mean, Hitler, Stalin, monsters, and, 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 and they may try to they create Castro the monster too. But if we just Castro back off of this. this Castro is one of my heroes. Oh, I know. But I'm just saying, you can label it. Right, that right. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody have, yeah, Jean? I want to make a quick remark of when they talk about freedom of speech. <coughs> and you have to think of people at, who have told the truth, who, who gain an audience. And uh, you have people like Chelsea Manning and uh, Richard Snowden and Julian Assange, you know, waste, sent to prison. When, they, when people are starting to hear the voices of the truth that they speak, and they don't last long, you know, they're in big trouble. Now we have students uh, that are uh, demonstrating against uh, what what's happening in, with the Israeli government, and of course they're called, uh, you know, anti-Semitists, which have nothing to do with their, gov their complaints about the government. But now they're threatened that not even to have jobs when they, you know, and uh, the, the repression is terrible. And we go along with it, you know. We say we don't want Russia or China interfering in our politics, but 
you know, we, Israel pretty much runs our politics and what we can say and do around here, and that's all there is to it. This is a one, the, yes. the other point I wanted to make is there are at least semi-socialist countries that have, until mass migration has destabled them, destabilized them somewhat, is that, you know, the uh, Scandinavian countries have been very successful. And there was an argument years ago between a guy from there and from here about, you know, how we can't afford, you know, to feed, clothe, and house everyone and have medical care. You know, and he says, well, we pay for it by feeding, clothing, housing people. We cut down on crime so much that the money we save on prisons and law enforcement and all that is paying for all these programs. So uh, we have had relatively successful, relatively socialist countries that have done quite well. Thank yeah, you. Oh, yeah, I stand by that very strongly. Yeah, yeah. very much so. He's a co-editor of the American Prospect, <laughs> all right, and he was talking about Peter Peterson of the Peterson Institute, which wanted to really do away with privatized Social Security. And Bill Clinton was buying into this. But fortunately, Monica Lewinsky came along and distracted it. <laughs> I've heard yes. Hey, thanks, thanks for buying, John. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I think, and I'm probably wrong, but since the beginnings of agriculture 12,000 years ago, it has been a war of the one tenth of one percent against the workers. And and I'm 76 years old. We fought against the war in Vietnam, the war in all of Southeast Asia, against the war in Iraq, against the war in Afghanistan, and we forgot completely about the main war, which is the one-tenth of one percent against the workers. And that's why we have so many people liking Trump. He's angry, and he they say, He's angry like me, yeah. and they're right to be angry. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, any job, a clerk at Safeway was enough for six, a family of six, a home mortgage, a car, and maybe a truck. And my generation has allowed it to deteriorate. Well, I, I, so my don't, don't, don't take it personally, okay? Well, I mean, my generation <coughs> of baby boomers and flower children ignored the real problem. Well, I, I think some some of that generation tried to do their darndest, okay? But Not without, enough of us, no, very well, few. Well, the, the multinational corporations, the banks, mm -hmm. the arms industry, the, the Zionists, they're very powerful, okay? And they control the media, they control the narrative. And I, I'm not, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to blame the majority of any group that's working class in this society for the responsibility of all of this. I do agree 100% with you about the pro-Trump supporters. I think I said this last time I was, we had this session, I, that I spent nine weeks in Europe this summer and I took a bunch of, this is the taxi cab story. I took all these uh, taxi, cab rides. In fact, I landed in London and jumped in a cab. The guy could hear that I was from the U.S. and the first thing he said was not where, he, where do you want to go, buddy? He said, what's wrong with your country? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I heard about eight or nine people uh, in, Bur in Budapest and in Berlin, you know, so what's wrong with your country? And since I'm being traveled somewhere, taken somewhere, it's going to take 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I had to con condense it all very, very quickly. And this is a response to your, your point, ma'am. Is I said two things. I said in the early 1970s, the U.S. deindustrialized the country, okay? Which meant it took away living wage manufacturing and industrial jobs, and it led to the collapse of private sector labor unions, okay? which was a countervailing force politically in this country, okay? And it shifted the economy to a multi-tiered uh, service-based economy with majority of people on contract labor rather than full labor. And all, all you have to do is go over here to Chico State 
How many, John knows all about it. How many part-time, Stacy knows all about it. How many part-time teachers they have as one example oh, in this God. economy, you know, to, to, uh, to, to depoliticize people, you know, and have them at each other's throats. But the next point I want to make relates to the, the Democrats. The, well, the broader point related to the second point is that that also saw the two parties as the fabric, the socioeconomic fabric, fabric of the country changed. The two parties redefined their electoral coalitions, okay? And the Democratic Party shifted its electoral coalition away from uh, uh, you know, labor unions. To Republican life. To Republican life, exactly. Mm -hmm. And to upper middle class uh, professionals, at Silicon Valley types, Hollywood, et cetera. And it gave the white working class to the Republicans, okay? Mm -hmm. And they were being captured by Reagan initially in the 80s with the so-called Reagan Democrats on social issues, okay? I have a, a, a brother who is a born again Christian and he was in a labor union. But in the early 80s, we got in this big fight because he was going to vote Republican. And I said, why are you going to vote Republican? He says, I, I'm against abortion. I said, they're against labor unions. He said, I don't care. You know? and, and so you guys get the drift of what has happened. In the single country. issues. Single, single issues, issues and their social yeah. issues right. and wedge issues. And oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So what's happened is, I mean, that's what's happened in our society. And, and Trump comes along as a, you know, to take full, for his ego and to take full advantage of that dynamic. Yes? The reason I hold my generation responsible is because we had, oh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> we had free education. If you lived in Davis, which I did, you could work six weeks at a dollar twenty-five minimum wage and get, uh, pay your whole year's tuition and books. It's true. Um, we all became professionals, and we, it's classes. We ignored the blue collar workers. Yeah. yeah, well my father was a carpenter and I became a university professor for, because of free education. Yeah. 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 yeah, any other, let me wrap this up with can some. Can I ask one last question? Yes, you can, yes you can. Uh, about, uh, I'm asking, because Russia's military is so very powerful, uh, do you, I'm questioning why the, they haven't just, Finalize things there with Ukraine, or if or if they have, if there's some uh, philosophy to drag it out themselves, that maybe like we're trying to um, to uh, harm them by keeping them in these wars, like we started keeping mm -hmm. Afghanistan. If there's something behind it, if they that they're they're kind of slow walking this war. Well, well I think there's three things. I think that. Yeah. And there are other opinions here as well. I think one, the Russia does not want to take over all of Ukraine. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, secondly, they're fighting a war that they're attempting to minimize yeah. civilian deaths. Okay. People might not understand that or accept that, but that is their strategy. And thirdly, it is a war of attrition, hopefully to string, string out Europe and possibly the United States to where they get exhausted related to financing Ukraine. So I think it's a three-track strategy. Um, there's, also, there's already some elements of that in the United States related to the Trump forces within Congress. But, uh, and it's cl clear that the Democrats aren't gonna win the election next November, so don't even waste any energy to try to support the Democrats because Biden's support of Israel has ripped the party apart, okay? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there are lots of different groups, starting with Palestinian Americans and Arab Americans and, yeah. and Muslim Americans that are not gonna vote Democrat because of their support for Israel, okay? What are they gonna vote? Huh? Are they going to vote for Trump? No, no they're not. They're not going to vote for the president. No, no. So, is there a chance that that an individual? I would think that that's in our system still. That an individual could run for president 
and not be Republican, not be, you know, independent or whatever. And aren't we, isn't our government set up for a non organization thing to, no, to come in? No, the two parties work in concert to control the electoral system of this country. Now, if you are very wealthy, like Ross Perot, you can get 18% of the of the vote. So it's not about the vote. No, it's not about the vote. No. Then we're all duped? Yes. Well, yes. Maybe that's the one with word. Our brainwashed is the word I use. With, with our political people that are not, if they were in place, all the different governmental people, and there was enough votes to change the laws, yeah. could there then be well, a non-Republican, you know, Democrat? Now you're getting back to political science. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> is that the founding fathers, I, I learned this from uh, Richard Hofstadter in his American Political Traditions book, the chapter on the founding fathers. Mm -hmm. Read that in 1962 when I was a freshman in college. And what Hofstadter explained is the founding fathers who were the elites of that era, the wealthiest people in the colonies and now the new state, the new country, they created a system that had the illusion of democracy, but it perpetuated elite class rule because it instilled in the Constitution all of these checks on real democracy. Yeah. And we, we can start with uh, the Electoral College, for example, okay? And a whole list of other factors to put checks on the ability of not a, a, a cabal of non-elites capturing government to change the course of government. I mean, hypothetically, you know, I could be, become president of the United States but I wouldn't control Congress or the Supreme Court, for example, et cetera, et cetera. We could take over Congress, but we wouldn't control the Supreme Court or the executive branch, and the bureaucracy of the, of the country as well. So it has an enormous uh, ability to permit, maintain elite or capitalist class rule in and, our society. And if everybody that could vote voted for for those non-Republican Democrats. Well, he, here, here's the rub, it's very obvious. You got uh, Jill Stein, you've got uh, uh, Cornell West, you even got Robert, Robert Kennedy Jr. Jr. Uh, I don't know the Libertarian candidate, and there's probably others. Uh, apparently Mark Cuban is gonna run an independent candidacy. But the point is, is who, where do you find out about these candidacies? They don't have them interviewed I will on tell the, you. the PBS News Hour. You know. <coughs> yes. Yeah, RFK Jr. is not <laughs> what the media is telling you about. That because he actually has some very good ideas, and on the back of one of those handouts, I have, I guess, sort of an editorial he wrote that the only place that would publish it, of course, would be Fox News. It's good on peace. He's bad on Israel. But of course, if he was fair on Israel, the lobby would defeat him. Uh, there's a good chance if people got off their asses, he's the one person that knows how the government works, unlike Trump. We could probably, he, could, he is into peace except relative to Israel. Okay, well, the Arabs and China have to take care of Israel. The U.S. is useless. And, and they will. What? You think so? And they will. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so the RFK could win the electoral college. I mean, it would be thrown to the House of Representatives if no one gets the majority. And there's a good chance he would be a compromise candidate between Biden and Trump. And you really should Google stuff about him or listen to YouTube interviews. There's some people that have done very good long interviews with him. The guy is smart. <coughs> he was very successful as an environmental attorney. He's not the savior, but he could get us by 
for four years while the Democratic Party <laughs> is really yeah, Let's move on. Let's move on. We got two questions, and I want to wrap this up so I feel better when I go home tonight <laughs> that I actually created something. Please. Yes. Um, why will the Arabs in China be? holding up Israel. Okay, well, this, this actually is part of my last comments, okay? And, and the, 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 what I wanted to talk about was the, the war in Gaza and the Ukraine war and what impact they have had on uh, U.S. global hegemony. And my argument has been that the U.S. has been in decline for a number of years and that these two wars are in fact accelerating that decline, yes. okay? And the patterns of decline have to do with the Chinese, Russian, et cetera, Eurasian integration project, okay? And the global south, the global south aligning with that, okay? Yes. Which is a counterpoint <laughs> to Western in interest, so can US, Canada, and Western Europe, Japan, Australia, et cetera. And I'll just, I won't comment on Ukraine right now, I'll comment on the Gaza story. Uh, what has already happened related to weakening US hegemony? One, it, it has clearly exposed US complicity with uh, with Israel and its genocide yeah. for the whole world to see. And as we've said the last time, unprecedented global protests have occurred because of this. I mean, unbelievable stuff, uh, et cetera. Uh, and my comment here, and part of why I can say that, is who is gonna believe the United States when the next war that it wants to promote he, they claim that they want to do this to defend democracy, human rights, and uh, the rules-based international order. Nobody's going to buy that ever again, okay? That's been put, put aside, okay? So that's number one. Two, what it's done, it has forced the uh, conservative and reactionary political regimes in the Middle East to move away from Israel, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, there's been this so-called Abrams Accord starting in 2020. In fact, the Trump administration, Jared Kushner is responsible for this, was to normalize relations between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, Oman, Sudan, and Morocco. And Biden has been negotiating and up until a few days before October 7th, the, the uh, normalization with Saudi Arabia was accelerating, okay? That process is dead in the water, okay? Uh, and what has also happened is those regimes have come together, they haven't done anything concretely now, but they have met under the auspices of the Arab League and also the Islamic uh, Cooperation Organization to discuss the issues at hand. You've had conferences where Assad, the president of Iran, Rasi, uh, Sisi, the president of Egypt, BSM or whatever his name is, the, 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 the Sultan of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, all these guys have been in the same room at the same table where the last 20 years they've been killing each other, okay? This has caused that to happen, okay? And then all of these delegations have gone to Beijing and they've gone to Moscow to meet with a, a representatives there. And a week and a half ago, uh, President Xi made a statement at a joint meeting of those groups along with the BRICS meetings, it was a Zoom meeting, where he came out and said that we need uh, to form a, a committee or a group to expedite the resolution of this crisis, meaning the establishment of a Palestinian state, okay? Now, what this does is it just further isolates Israel in this option. 
And then uh, the third level is uh, this era, this axis of resistance as well. Uh, if, if, and I don't, nobody wishes this, okay? But a few years, of, not a few years ago, let's say seven or eight or nine months ago, many of us thought that, that the Ukraine war was going to provoke a world war, okay? I can, I, I personally feel we've passed that point, okay, for a variety of reasons, but I do not feel that way related to this war in Gaza, okay? Mm -hmm. If is, Israel continues to do what it's doing, and I don't see anything that's gonna make it stop, uh, there is at a point when Hezbollah is gonna, is gonna invade Israel, okay? Yeah. And, the, and, and Erdogan is going to be forced, if not to send his military, to send Turkish people who want to defend Palestine, similar to the Abraham Lincoln Brigade during the Spanish uh, Civil War in the 1930s. What we're going to have is a regional war. And if there's a regional war that brings Iran in, and by this time the U.S. is involved, and you can guess what the next stage will be, okay? So, um, I thought you were going to end up on a good <laughs> <laughs> Well, this, it's a warning. I mean, it's a warning. Uh, oh, whatever you like to do every day, start doing it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.